Hello, everyone. Welcome to Make Believers, a YouTube series from Make Believe Seattle that focuses on genre filmmakers from around the globe, how they work, where they get their inspirations, and much more. Joining us this week is the writer and director of Jessica Cabin, a new queer horror comedy that took home the Audience Choice Award for Best Midlink at year one of our festival. Daniel Montgomery, thanks for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. Um, so you were just talking about there being thunderstorms in L.A. right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me, I remember my first week in L.A., we actually had a thunderstorm. The very first week I moved there. Oh, I remember, wow. Yeah, and I remember driving through the streets of, like, the valley at that time and watching people, like, like uh, not shook, knowing what to do, like straight up shook by the fact yeah. that there was thunder and lightning. So what's the, oh. what's the scene on the ground there in Los Angeles? So it's dark. It's stormy. People are confused. A a, a, one of my best friends yesterday, she, she uh, sent me a little voice memo while she was stuck in traffic. And she said, she said, um, she's like, you know, the beginning of Shaun of the dead. Right. And I said, yes. And she's like, I feel like, I feel like it's the beginning of Shaun of the Dead. I feel like there are zombies out, something's in the air, and she's just trying to make it to work and kind of looked around and thought like, is there something going on? You know? <laughs> um, it's weird. It feels weird. It's been the rainiest, stormiest year. I've lived in LA for <laughs> something years, and I it is the stormiest, weirdest year of my life here, for sure. And I'm on board. Like, I'm into it. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm in for some weird. I'm in for Shaun of the Dead. Like here, bring on the zombies. Like let's switch it up. It's just different. <laughs> you know that you've reached the status of being an old man like I have when the first question I come up with is weather related. I know. It's, it just like starts to happen. I remember having a conversation with my best friend in middle school and our parents were talking about weather and we said, are we going to get to an age where we just talk about weather? And then one day, Billy Ray, it just... All of a sudden it happened and I'm, we're talking about weather. Yeah. We're I talking about weather. When I don't talk about weather, I like to just ride around with friends and look at other people's houses. Yeah. That's when you know you've reached a certain age. I do the same thing, except I do it on a, a walk. I'll walk around the neighborhood and just oh. kindly observe into other people's houses and see like, what an interesting paint color choice. Or I like that plant. Oh, look, the Finnegan's have a new gate up this year. How exciting. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, they're lemon tree. It started to like started to grow. Like that's where I am. So I get it. <laughs> well, um, unfortunately, I did not bring you on here to talk about how old we are. Oh um, man, I I just felt like I trashed myself enough for that. We might as well go in a different direction. Sure. Um, I I don't know. A little birdie told me that you might make movies. It's true. I might. I might. I might keep making movies too oh you might oh so it's not just going to be one and done then i don't think so oh wow I'm, well that's exciting i'm yeah i'm excited for the future well you know i'm going to take us all the way back please so, uh you know we both have in common this very real aspect which is that we're both from the south yeah. so um and you know i know what my experience was growing up in the south as a creative person as a person who enjoys the look feel and appearance of penises more than vaginas for sure and, and so i kind of want to just roll back there and kind of ask to start off so what was it like growing up in the south with i would assume you were in the same position that i have having a minuscule amount of queer films with which you can really invest yourself in and uh What's it like growing up in the South with those constraints on what you can and can't watch? Ooh, growing up in the South was terrifying, Billy Ray. <laughs> it really was. It was rough. Rip that Band-Aid right off. Terrifying. You know, like, and I'm here to talk about it. It, it was... Um, it was hard. It was really hard. Well, specifically, where specifically in the South did you grow up? I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yep. Yep, right there. And... Although um, all, it wasn't, it wasn't all terror. It truly, it truly wasn't, but it was challenging, like a very, a very challenging environment. And I went to a small private Christian high school. I went to like, like K through 12, same, same school all the way through. And it, 
small class of people. And I was the only gay person that I really knew. Um, and I didn't even know I was necessarily. So when I'm, when I was looking for ways to express myself, who I tried, I tried hard and I ended up switching high schools one, one time because, um, because apparent I, I wanted to be an actor. Like I was full on, like, let's do the school play. And I switched high schools. I went to a different high school, my fresh, my freshman year. Um, because they had a better drama program than the one I was currently attending. And things were worse. I got bullied horribly there. And so bad so that I had to go back to the, the original high school. And I did a lot. I, I just, it, it, I felt like I didn't fit in at all. I was, I like had, a, had, a, had friends, um, but I just was kind of biding my time truly and thinking like, yeah. I can't wait to get out of here and get away from these like, these people that don't know what they're talking about, don't know what they're doing, that are so boring, that are so lazy. Like, I want to I wanna feel my fantasy spin. Like, I want to do all of the things. And I was just biding my time to get out. Um, when it came to watching things, I, um, private Christian, uh, growing up as a private Christian school and uh, church-going parents who are totally sweet and a total blast, I was not allowed to watch MTV. I was not allowed to watch certain things. So there definitely was this sort of like HBO mystique of like trying to find the things I wasn't supposed to watch and then figure out why, you know? And I definitely found my, my what tickled me um, in horror. I found what it seemed to, for some reason, even though I wasn't allowed to watch MTV, I was allowed to watch R-rated horror films. And even my dad showed me oh. Alien when I was very yeah. young. So it was kind of like this thing that felt like horror's cool, horror's accepted across all fronts. So it was something taboo that I could dip into a little bit, you know? That's, that's actually really interesting because I had a revelation. I think the last time I, I, it was actually last year for Christmas, I'd gone home to visit my family and we had a Christmas dinner with the side of the family that I just had not seen very often or not in a very long time. And what I remember of, of my, my cousin, my first cousin um, who used to watch me when I was younger was that, you know, obviously very religious, very strict conservative. Um, all they had on their walls were like Disney clamshells. It was yeah. that time of house. But then I went there last Christmas and I looked up at that same shelf where she kept all of her movies and like 40% were horror films like straight up horror films. And I was like, oh, where did these come from? And she was like, oh yeah, I love horror films. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. So there seems to be some sort of like pass, I guess, for like yeah, Christians right? who like, well, you know, if there's a homosexual character in it, no, 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 no. We certainly don't want our children seeing that. But if someone's getting their spinal cord ripped out of their throat, that's, that's okay. okay. That's okay. It, it is also like sex is bad, murder's fine. You know, like- any type yeah. of sex is like absolutely not. And then, you know, guns, great. You know, that's, I, I also grew up loving comic books and I loved X-Men and I loved Rogue and Storm and, you know, all, all of those characters. And all, all of the good, all of the solid Dyke X-Men. Sure, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I loved X-Men because it was a team and it was diverse and it was bright and it was, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah they had superpowers and all of that. And I remember my dad and, and that sort of graduated into stuff like Sp spawn and yeah. other, other sort of dark, yeah. the max like darker comic books. And that's what led to my dad saying like, Oh, I see that you like these, you know, heroes and some of the, some of them skew scary. So, and he showed me alien and aliens absolutely scared me to death. And I, and I kind of never looked back after that, you know, so I'm curious, what was, you know, I think we all have that moment, you know, especially in a place like the South, when you're growing up queer in the South, you don't really see yourself represented. At least I certainly didn't. I graduated, no. I was class of 2000. Mm -hmm. And so I certainly, you know, besides Will and Grace, which is what everybody always throws sure. down to, like, you don't, especially in the late 80s, early 90s, there wasn't a lot of representation. So what was the moment for you when you first saw yourself on screen? 
Ooh, it w- this is going to be, I didn't even, this is coming organically out of me. I've never Good. said this out loud, never had this thought. Um, and it's going to sound weird, but it was bring it on. Do you remember? Okay. Bring it on. I, I, yes, very well. There's a moment where there's two gay characters that quickly connect at the competi- at the cheerleading competition, and it's not a joke. It's and there are a lot of gay jokes, a lot of gay jokes. But there's a quick sort of like spark between two comp- cheerleading competitors, and it was supposed to be like a sort of a a quick but sweet moment. And it was the first time I remember seeing something and feeling like, oh it's okay to be happy for them. It's, and, and, and it literally, I remember feeling my body change. I remember feeling like warmth inside of me and feeling something I hadn't felt before. And at the time I didn't necessarily know I was gay. I didn't even know that was it. And this is how my brain was. I didn't even know it was an option thinking of it as a choice. Like yeah. what? I didn't even know it was an option, but I remember seeing that in the movie theater and we were able, like every, I saw it with a big group of friends, like middle school, like big group of friends and everybody was laughing at the gay jokes and and there's not tons, but laughing at all the stuff you're supposed to laugh at. And then that there's this quick, sweet moment. And I remember thinking like, oh, wow, that's different. I've never seen that before. I've never seen that that feels okay. I've never seen a gay character not be the butt of a joke. Um, and it's and it really like physiologically, I remember feeling changed by that, you know, um, and it just left a, it left an impact on me. I and I like yeah. looked over. I remember looking over to my friends that were sitting there, and thinking that we're all smiling at this, and this is good, and this is a quick moment in this movie, and it's moving on. And um, how exciting! I think the takeaway from this is that being gay is a choice. That's right. Uh, it's one hundred percent a choice. It's a choice. Uh, it's a choice so I've chosen. So yes, if you're having a rough time, just choose. Just choose different. Yeah, and I chose no. in that moment. That's when I chose. <laughs> See, yeah, for me, it was definitely. I think mine was beautiful thing in 1996. Oh, okay. I think that was for me the moment when I was like, I mean, I you know, look, I knew I started registering that I was queer pretty young. Like I yeah. knew I was like eight or nine that something was different. Yes, and you just but when you're eight or nine, you don't really have you lack both the vocabulary and sort of the insight to know sure. exactly what you are. And plus, you're like, it's all that insecurity too, right? Of like, well, I feel this way, but no one else seems to feel no this one way. else seems to. You know? So, you know, maybe this is crazy. But by the time I was about 12 or 13, I kind of knew what it was. And, you know, I'd seen Philadelphia. I'd seen all these films. About, right. You know, being gay. But of course, in my mind, if you're gay, well, you're dying of AIDS. That's just the way it works. Yeah. You're immediately dying of AIDS. Yeah, and that's so the only choice. I think Beautiful Thing was the first time where I saw being gay in sort of a positive light. Yeah, it was like, oh, you can be this thing and you can have like the you can have these like relationships or these flings and all these things. And you're not necessarily going to die of AIDS and like being gay can be a happy thing and a joyful thing. It could be. Yeah. 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 And I I didn't have a lot of that. And, you know, you don't see a lot of that, you know, growing up in the South, as you're well aware, like in hindsight, I certainly didn't think anybody else in my class felt the same way I did. In hindsight, now I can pick several of them. (laughs) Sure. Who, same who, name, actually. Yeah. How many? How many from your class came out eventually? Well, it's I. I have such a. I have such a. Um. A specific experience because I have a an identical gay twin brother. So, That's right. It's caused me great confusion in the past. I know, and it still it causes everyone great confusion anytime either one of us walk out of the house, or sometimes even when we don't. And I, you know, and he he and I had the same experience growing up, but our coming out experiences were very different. And, and I can't help but feel, and, and I, I sort of was like thrown almost literally thrown out of the closet in high school. And, and he, he, he had his own journey after high school and after college. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to speak for him about his journey necessarily, but mine definitely was high school. And so even at the time of, you know, just like you were saying, eight or nine, I felt, I also felt different, but I also had this built-in best friend who had similar interests. And I wasn't even, 
I, there is things going on inside of my brain and my body that I, I, I didn't feel comfortable sharing even with my twin brother. Right. Like yeah. I, we grew up in such an environment that what that was a parent's great for the most part. Um, but like the outside environment was so truly like aggressive and, uh, and oppressive that yeah. I didn't know if I could feel comfortable even sharing some of my feelings and thoughts with my twin brother. And it really wasn't until college that we were able to sort of actively like talk it out. And I didn't necessarily expect just because we are identical, literally identical twins that we would feel the same or have the same experience. So even though I was having these feelings and feeling different and queer and all of the stuff that I couldn't put words to that didn't necessarily, I, I didn't assume that my brother felt the same way. Sure. Right. And it turns out he did, he, you know, he really, we, we kind of, we kind of did, but it, I still felt so, even though I had this built in best friend, I still felt like pretty a alone in that. I'm not sure anybody feels like me. And I wasn't even aware that anybody in the planet felt like me. Yeah. You know, like I didn't, I, you just, we just didn't see that, that option. <laughs> I don't want to keep bringing it back to a choice, but like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we didn't, we didn't see that, you know, truly we talk about representation all the time, but it, I didn't see that representation. So I didn't even know I was, I feel like I was in some ways late coming to understand for me, understanding who I am and um, you know, like how, how I identify. It definitely felt like, I didn't, I didn't have any say in the matter. Yeah. Because it's not a choice, everyone. It just it's happens. It turns out it's not. Turns out it's not a choice. Um, and, we, and we both went through, we, we don't have to make this deep and dark, but Matthew and I both, <laughs> my, my, my twin brother and I, I, I had to go to conversion therapy in high school. Oof. So my senior year and Matthew did later. Um, and it's, it's for, for me, it's not quite, it wasn't quite as scary as it, it could sound because I had an awareness that I wasn't going to take any of it seriously. And I was respectful. I just was like, no, I'll do this because my parents are making me, but like, and, and then we're going to move on. Yeah. Had you, had you seen, but I'm a cheerleader at this point. No, because oh. I, I knew that it existed and I was definitely aware of it, but I felt scared to pursue it or watch it because it had this air of, um, I don't know, it almost like had this seductive quality in a way where it's like, this is, this is, this is, a, this is a, an alternative story and it's dark and funny. And it, it appealed to a lot of things that were going on in my brain, but I thought, I felt like I should resist it, you know? So I had an awareness of it, but I actively yeah. resist seeking it out because I didn't want to be tempted by whatever whatever was was in there yeah. well that would have been a that would have been a nice uh sort of guidebook to help you through conversion therapy i, I know uh, in all I the know. worst ways um so so talk to me a little bit about wh when does the idea of oh i want to make films when does that pop into your brain is that something that were you was it tw twinkling up there when you were younger or is it something you grew into well, mostly when uh, when I was younger, I really and I, and I still I'm I'm an actor. I work all the work all the time, all um, the time, but, all the time. Um, I I always knew I wanted I wanted to perform and be an actor essentially. And I went out. I came out um, to L.A. and went to theater school and and acted you know throughout college and and have ever since. It wasn't until it was in some ways it I didn't even think of myself as having the option back to choice being yep. an option of like a storyteller or filmmaker until um, somebody gave me the opportunity to start writing for myself essentially. And I, my creative partner, Riley Rose Critchlow, who's very heavily involved in the Jessica cabin, other producer was my essentially a, a first AD slash assistant director um, and also co-lead she and I have worked together for many, many, many years. And we were, we did a lot of sketch comedy together and we both sort of organically learned that we liked the stuff that we liked to perform the most was the stuff that we were writing for ourselves. So that twinkle began when I thought, Oh, I, I, I have a stage and I can write whatever I want and say whatever I want and perform however I would like to. 
And once that door was opened, that moved into, well, like maybe we can make a pilot of our stuff, which we did. And then maybe we can make a short film. And then it felt like just a natural leap to say like, well, why not a feature film? And if not me, then who, you know, like I feel like yeah. I have so much I want to say and so much that I want to write for literally for myself and for Riley and for others that I just, it kind of felt why, like, why not? And organically grew into, yeah, that seems like the logical next step. And I feel confident that I can pull it off. Um, so it wasn't an active, like, um, you know, laying in my bed at seven years old being like, I'm, I'm going to make a movie one day. It was more like, I'm going to be in a movie one day. And then I was, and then I thought, well, actually let me make one because I'm not seeing the stuff on screen or on my laptop or wherever. I'm not seeing the stuff on there that I would like to be doing. Yeah. And it's fun to play the sassy gay waiter. And I have at least 10 times and like, give me that check, you know, like, give me the check. But there's also more that I can do and would like to do. Although sassy gay waiter works just great, but like, let's, let's do, let's do more than that. And I'm not getting it. So let me write it and do it. Well, I'm curious how, how you feel about this because I, you know, I made a film several years ago and one of the questions, I got this question a couple of different times actually at Q and A's when it was on the festival circuit because I, I obviously am a queer person. I don't hide that. It's pretty obvious once you've met me or heard me speak for a few minutes. Because usually I'll work in someone being hot in the room within a few minutes of speaking. But sure. I kept getting asked, like, because the first film I made was not a queer film at all. It didn't have any really queer. You could read maybe some subtext into it, but that's all in the eye of the beholder. It yeah. certainly wasn't intentional. And I got a lot of not backlash, but a lot of like, well, don't you feel an obligation? That's the word that mm. I kept hearing. Don't okay. you feel an obligation as a queer person to be tackling queer stories? And my response was always no. Like, I don't feel an obligation to tackle queer stories any more than I feel an obligation to tackle Southern stories. Sure. Or, I mean, like, no. Like, but I understood the question to a degree because I do think that um, I think there is this idea misconceived as it is that like, well, if you're a gay person, that's all you're interested in. All yeah. you're interested in is like guys and having sex and like sparkly unicorns and erasure and all and of that it. shit. Yeah. And it's like we contain multitudes. So I'm curious, do you feel that obligation? And what was it? that made you decide, and we're going to specifically focus on Jessica Cabin here, and we're going to show the trailer in actually just a second, but um, did you feel any sort of obligation that this is my first feature? Um, I want to intentionally tackle these things, or was it just like, this is who I am, this is going in here, it's not even something I even thought about? You know, it, it really is kind of a mixture of both, in a way. I don't, I don't feel, um, I don't feel an obligation to sort of ha have to tell the gayest stories, but I, I feel like I'm privileged to in a way, like it's almost like- That's a good way well, to put it. Well, why not? Like, why not? I, I, I'm, I'm not, inter it's, it's what I'm like, I'm not interested in telling other stories that I can't identify with, at least right now. Like I, it, it, I've made a point to sort of, it's just innately what's within me to write to write gay care to write gay characters or queer characters, and I feel like what's important for me is to have queer characters or have the gay experience, but not necessarily make that the crux or drama of right. the story, because it ties back to bring it on in a way. I can't believe this yeah. is gonna all gonna be about bring it on, um, but like spirit fingers. But it, it's it's just <laughs> showing that the, like. The, there's again we contain multitudes so there there is more to us as gay people there's there there's a range of experience and let's just show the let's just show the range and yeah. so i feel i feel like it's important to show that range and i feel privileged to show the range and i'm that's all i'm interested i i also write like I've written a, a good amount of screenplays and stuff that have been assignments that aren't necessarily my films. Sure. And I will fight to have the lead characters or be, be gay or have 
Um, oh gosh, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna share a quick anecdote that I did not did share. Not sign. I'm not gonna sign. I didn't sign an NDA on, so I'm just gonna talk about it. Um, I wrote I wrote a horror script that was sort of birthed from my idea that that was based on nightmares and tr- tr- um, I'm thinking about how much I, I should technically say, but again, no NDA. <laughs> NDA but there 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 there's a lead gay character and he is bad. They're battling nightmares come to life essentially a range of nightmares showing a range. So like literal monsters to like stresses at work like a range of nightmares and we got some feedback or i got some feedback uh about well since this guy is gay why can't his fear be like he's scared of something in his closet and i just was like what and they said why don't we have this monster be like literally like a skeleton in his closet he's like oh my god i was like that's the exact opposite of what i'm going for and i said no and like I'm going to fight for there not to be that, you know, I, I think we're good. Like, I think we're good on that. And, and I think those stories like have value and we, and I just am like, I'm not interested in, in that. That's, you know, it's, that's exactly it. And I think, I think a lot of what sort of, because I've been programming for film festivals for the last like 16 years. So I've been doing it. I had done it quite a while before I made my first film. And I think I was just so immersed in the queer festival world at that yeah. time. Like that's all my brain had been consuming for the past several years. So it was like, how many more films, how many more documentaries about AIDS can I watch? How many more films about a, a young kid coming out to his mother next to the piano can I watch? Like, like yeah. how many of these do I need? And I think when I was ready to make my film, I was just... I want to do everything but that. But then that said, like I'm getting my second film together now and it's, it's got queer characters and it has an inherently queer story. It wasn't intentional. It was just, you know, it's just what the next project that seemed right was. Yeah. And I think, I, I, I think, you know, the we contain multitudes thing I think is apt, but I also, you know, I like what you said, like I want to be putting things out into the world that are original and unique and haven't been done a thousand different times. And if I'm going to present a queer character, I want to try to present them in a way that maybe they haven't been presented before. Sure. And what's, and what's the way they're rarely presented? Just as fucking people who live their lives and do things and things what happen a around them. Yes. It shouldn't, you, the whole story doesn't have to revolve around them coming out, having an illness or like cheating on their boyfriend. Like there can be things that happen within that aren't those things. Yes, exactly. Or like the terror of like being bullied and like, and you know, like all like the, oh. the oppression of it all. Like, oh, I just want to, I, I, I would just love to watch something gay and scary that just doesn't have to, the, the terror isn't me, isn't me identifying, like doesn't have to come from being gay, essentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to dive into the film, but before we do that, I'm going to actually uh, show the trailer, which I'm sure you've seen a thousand times. I have. So, so uh, we'll just watch it together, and then we'll dive back in. Great. Okay. I'm going to die if there's no wife on it. I'm really glad we decided to do this. the name of the cabin on the listing it's called the jessica the jessica you don't think she died here do you maybe He doesn't even know we exist. We don't. Oh, it was like seeing it for the first time. Yeah, that movie look. That movie looks good. <laughs> I, I'm gonna let you in on a secret. It's okay. Yeah, it's all no. right. <laughs> so it's I, I so I want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna attempt to not ask you questions that I've asked you 
before and multiple Q, in, in a Q and A before you because can. that gets that gets really boring. Um, <laughs> but I am curious. So I, I mean, obviously, we know you shot this during the pandemic. Yeah, uh, you shot it with some close friends of yours. Talk a little bit about this because I'm fascinated by this, and obviously, I don't want you speaking out of turn for anybody that isn't here. But I correct me if I'm wrong, but a couple of the people that you worked with on this project were kind of having their own sort of sexual identity awakenings around yeah. the same time. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. My two, two of my best, best friends who are my co-leads, essentially, sort of had, you know, 2020 epiphanies where Riley, Riley was like, I'm non-binary. And Chase is like, I'm gay. And it... And it, and it was just an exciting, you know, verbalization of what was going on inside of them. And I love them both so much. And I've worked with them so much and created so much with them that it felt important to me. And I think to us, to when we dis we we sort of collectively decided to let's make a movie that that they should re reflect that revelation on screen, essentially playing characters that um, in some ways reflect who they actually are, but also more so character the type of character they had not played before on screen. And both of them have worked quite a lot. Um, so it was an exciting opportunity to sort of honor them essentially for who they are, but also give this opportunity for them to play of a, of, of, you know, a, a, a shadow of themselves on screen and for all of us to do it together, you know, we hadn't, hadn't, have, hadn't had that opportunity in a long time um, and never before in a film. So that's kind of the spiritual birth of Jessica Cabin. Well, we hear a lot about like gender reveal and, and coming out parties that end with wildfires that demolish acres and acres of land. But we That's don't right. hear a lot about coming out parties that take the form of just making a movie. Yeah, let's just make a movie. It really, it, 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 it sounds like it was the, the, truly the impetus to making the movie. Um, it was more just that this, th this, you know, these revelations had happened over the pandemic. And it's sort of, I don't know, in some ways, especially for me and Chase, like bonded us pretty closely and, and like just add a further layer of depth to our friendships yeah. that um, allowed us to to be spending more time with each other than we had previous than previous years. And that organically evolved into let's make a movie, you know, like, why not? We, we we've made stuff together for years and years and years and. And now we're just leveling up in friendship. So let's just level up as, you know, artists. Yeah. Talk a little bit about specific inspirations for the film, because we've talked broadly before, but what are some specific sort of, not necessarily films. I mean, people are inspired by all sorts of things, films, TV, music, art, whatever. Like what were some of, what were some of the, what were the pieces of art that inspired you the most during the, at least the initial creative process of this film. Well, you know, my, I love ghosts. I, 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 I grew up, I'm wearing a Goosebumps shirt right now. Like I grew up an R.L. Stein Goosebumps child, like have a Goosebumps podcast with my brother. I, general spookiness is what excites me most. And I love, like, I was just looking at old photos. There's a tiny little picture of me Halloween dressed as a ghost when I was like three years old. I've always gravitated towards um, the spooky and yeah. specifically e e like R.L. Stein, the goosebumps of it all. There's something I, I, I've always insp been inspired by sort of campy charm of Halloweeny darkness, love nightmare before Christmas. So innately, a lot of what I have written and developed has had an element of spookiness and darkness to it. And, and that's what, that's what interests me. I love urban legends. I love lore. I also love like a good old, like nineties referential slasher scream. Yeah. I know what yeah. you did last summer, you know, urban legend, all of that. I love all of that delicious crash Halloween H2O. Like, I love I I live and breathe and love that. So that that's what inspires me on a daily basis is is the spooky campy darkness of it all. 
and throw in some, you know, 2020 vibes of, I, I do this thing where every, I have an immersive theater company. We do spooky shows every fall. We do one called Creep LA and I write the show and we do it. And it's um, a different theme every year. And after, after we wrap every year, I go to a cabin in the woods by myself for a couple days to sort of mourn the loss of Halloween, um, sure. sort of, sort of cleanse myself. Always, a, always a fun time, always a stressful time and sort of recharge. And I've already always sort of felt like connected to cabins and like going al alone away in the woods. Like I love Friday the 13th, love literally cabin in the woods and throw in 2020 where you feel like everybody feels like they're alone in a cabin essentially right like you can't you can't we can't leave the house yeah. we can't touch each other and i and i make this joke and i've made this joke in other q a's before but i was listening to a lot of taylor swift and i was like you know listening to folklore and feeling like my woodsy like all my hard feelings let's cry it out fantasy and somehow some way I don't know, inspired by a cabin, inspired by Taylor Swift, inspired by slow burn horror movies like It Follows, like the like the witch, like these yeah. woodsy, saturated sort of feeling things. And and Jessica Cabin just flew out of me. I wrote it so fast. I really how, didn't have to think how about fa how fast did you write it? I wrote it in 10 days. Like I there just you was go. Like, I was just like, sure. Like, and, and that's taking my time. I was like, no, yeah. like, let's not get crazy. Give yourself something to do next week. Like I wrote it so fast. Let, let me just it? say, I think, I think people get too much shit when they write scripts fast because I hear it all the time. It's like, well, you can't really develop this, develop that if you don't. And I'm like, I've written every script I've ever written, whether it's for stage or screen quickly. And what I would yeah. do when I ran my theater company was I would set a read through date before I'd even written a word of the script I love that. because I knew that was my deadline and I yeah. knew I would have it before. So I'd be finishing a script like three hours before we even showed up for a read through. And I don't think there's anything wrong. If you know what's there and you know what needs to be there, I don't think it matters if it takes you 10 days or 10 months. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, I well, thank you for that validation. Um, That's I, what I'm here for. <laughs> I really, I was thinking about this the other day. It's, I really felt like in the flow of it. I really felt like I was just channeling this idea. And part of it truly came out of, we know we, we don't, we at the time, I wrote at the end of 2020. So we still didn't know what the future looked like. So I thought, well, if I'm going to make this movie, it needs to be simple, essentially, and safe, literally. So that's why we narrow at least, I sort of narrowed it down to one location and I was like, spooky cabin, let's do it. You know, like that should be quote easy to make. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I was just, I, I, I was inspired by that. I also in the same way, this is gonna, all, all out of left field. Um, even though I don't, ra I rarely use sports analogies. That's baseball. Right. Um, I love like, uh, I love, uh, gosh, what's the way to phrase it? I love, of single white female fatal attraction, the crush, like any sort of like ex lover gone crazy. Yeah. Love that love. I love misery. I love like a crazy fan. And I had Kylie who played Jessica in the Jessica cabin. Um, I had her watch some of those movies because I love the idea of this Alicia Silverstone esque, like, uh, uh, like crazy girl. Um, yeah. you know, and, and really wanted Je Kylie as Jessica to look like Elisa Silverstone. I also was inspired by some of like the, the wild extreme ex lover sort of making bold murderous choices that also inspired me. And the last little piece that inspired me was a movie called, um, Martha Marcy May Marlene. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't like the thing about Martha Marcy May Marlene is I, it's a film that stuck with me for a long time. I don't necessarily love the movie. I just, it has such a un, it has such an unsettling vibe. The whole time you're like, is something really terrible going to happen? Yeah. Is this terrifying? I think so. Or maybe it's not, or maybe it's just like a slow burn all the way through and it never, yeah. it just stays. 
And that was one of my references, at least to- in some ways, tonally and visually. Um, I liked that sort of like unsettled quality where you're not quite sure. Um, and then <laughs> I got so many references. The last one, I know I already said the last one, but this is the last one. I also like, I love a lot of um, um, Miranda July's stuff. She has like a lot oh, of, sure. yeah, yeah, like, yeah such a really strange dead sense of humor you me and everyone we know like just like just dead sense of humor that um also really tickles me so like throw all that in a brain for half of 2020 and you get the jessica cabin um i'm curious i'm curious if there's any because i miranda july actually answers this question for me to some degree because i believe she shares some sensibilities with the person I was going to mention, which is Todd Salons, who mm-hmm. is one of my favorite filmmakers, who of course mm-hmm. did Happiness and Welcome to the Dollhouse. Yes. Yeah. And like just the master of like the awkward comedy, oh. like like the cringe comedy. Devastating. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like withering. That's cringe. the word I like. Withering. Withering. <laughs> and, um, That's it. But you say Miranda July, and that makes sense because they share some sensibilities, they, I think. I think, th- I think they definitely do. Yeah. And, you know, you know, obviously he shot during the pandemic, but it's not a pandemic movie, which I appreciate. No. Like it is, no. but it isn't. And that's because I think those are the ones that have, that have, you know, we've seen so many pandemic movies at this point. I'm sure. And most of them have crashed and burned, especially the higher profile ones, because they're all about the pandemic. Oh, we're in the pandemic. Look, we're wearing masks. Look, we're social distancing. And I'm like, that. we're not far enough removed away from it yet for those kinds of films to work. Yeah. But like, your film and then another film that came out this year called sick, which is a slasher film yes. that played on Peacock. I think yeah. they're like, honestly the best examples of a film shot during the pandemic. And even though sick does deal with the pandemic, it does so in a really clever way. I think they're the best to come out that have dealt with the pandemic. Was that ever a conversation for you? Like, should we show more? Should we, was that ever even on the table? No, it really wasn't. I, I, yeah. I did. I didn't want to, I wasn't interested in in acknowledging. <laughs> Honestly, I wanted. Well, it I wanted, dates it right. Like it, it dates it in a way where, like, if you're right. doing this movie and people are taking off their masks and do all this, like, oh, well, this is a pandemic movie, of course. And also, like, it's. I wanted it to feel. I go to films that most people, I think, are watched on to escape a little bit, right? So, like, yeah. I don't want to think about it. I also. You know, it's like spiritually a pandemic movie in a way because you feel you feel that like wanting to connect with people that yeah. and that obviously is innate and was there. But it's also a movie that could happen during the pandemic. And like sure. you, you don't know. We don't like we just see these characters come in and out of this Airbnb and they're within their own pod. So maybe it is. I, d- I wanted it to feel um, a little like not sure what time this film takes place in. But except for the fact that we know the character of Jessica, there's a little, you know, you see a, a little note that it, it shows that she was alive in the nineties. Right. Yeah. So I definitely wanted that, but I didn't want it. I didn't, I wanted you to be able to watch this movie in 20 years, you know, in right now or in 20 years and not necessarily feel, uh, feel something different. Yeah. Well, or, have it, or have it feel dated. And well, maybe yeah, the, it will. I don't know. But I like, mean, maybe, maybe not. But like, those are the films that to me always work the best. The ones that just don't necessarily, they either, it's, 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 I, it's like, it's one extreme or another, right? Like, it's either a film that is like so meticulous down to the detail, a period film, something like American Graffiti that, that stands the test of time, or it's something that has no time or place and it can be yes. set anywhere. The ones in yes. the middle are the ones that to me don't make the biggest impact, but the ones on the fringes right. are the ones that mean the most. Yeah. I didn't want it to feel like a check mark of like, we need to just acknowledge this and move on unless it's like sick. It's such a plot point. Yeah. Like sick. Yeah. Imp- like it's important to it and it's fun and you feel like you could watch that also in 20 years and be like, oh, that was this then. And it still feels like important and enjoyable to what it's supposed to be, right? But for this, I mean, no. The the, the funny thing, the uh, filming during the pandemic was, was wild. And, yeah. you know, it wasn't on screen, but I only saw my, like my sweet, wonderful DP, Jay Ruggieri, I actually only saw his face once. Like 
Oh, I like because everybody was in mask and shield. So I yeah. didn't even know like what he really looked like because we had met like on the phone. We'd met through friends. Like uh, we didn't even zoom. We just had phone calls and preparation and phone calls and phone calls. And we actually got to the set. There was a moment where we were on l- lunch and we had to eat like separate from everybody else. Like we eat in yeah. our cars or whatever. And and he and I were like walking into the desert, essentially talking about what we're going to film the rest of the day. And he t- he like took his mask off for a second. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's your sweet face. Like that's your face. <laughs> like wow, you know, it was it was it was crazy. Yeah, I I mean I mean I think we're gonna I think we're all still collectively sort of figuring out what those couple of years have meant, done to us have done to us are going yeah. to mean for us long term. I think people who used it as an opportunity to like express themselves and create, I think, I think I'm, I'm hoping that I'm hopeful that maybe we will uh, have been able to come to terms with it maybe in a better way because we were right. creating through it. Um, but so, talk a little bit about the film, you know, the film has been on the festival circuit for a little while now. Uh, yes. Talk a little bit about, you know, how's the film doing? What's the reception been? Uh, are there any fun updates about the film that, Yes, the the traveling sort of the festivals has been so wonderful. Like I, I, it's just it's really like been life changing for me personally. We essentially started in Seattle, and you know for the most part, Prom Springs first, but then really in Seattle and went to London and Toronto and Miami, and um, and the reception has been so um overwhelming and exciting and and we will you uh, we are still have more fe- some a few more festivals to go and then we will be um available to rent and buy we just got a release date today um, oh and but it might ch- it might change so i don't want to say it but it Who's is it with a, um through a company called freestyle digital media yeah. became our distribution company and they are so wonderful and such huge champions of the film, like had some wonderful meetings with them and it will be available um, to buy or rent on like 10 different (laughs) platforms um, in the fall. And then we'll hopefully move to another sort of like exclusive, um, another platform, either a horror esque one or uh, one that's a little, does a little more LGBTQ uh, content. But the it's funny because going into the film, making the film, I thought, where is this film gonna like land? Is it because yeah. it's not terrifying? It's not even scary, really. It's about ghosts and it's so spooky, but it's also there's a lot of obviously like uh, queer representation in the film and queer characters. And you know, submitting the film to festivals, I thought, is this gonna land in like a queer zone? is this going to be like a horror film or, and we have gotten into all of the above. It's been some specifically like horror festivals. Some have been genre, some have been queer and some have just been independent film festivals. So it's nice to feel like it has a range of an audience that doesn't feel like it's shoehorned into one, one sort of thing. Well, I mean, you're, you're in a good position with the three, the three boxes you check off because Straight festivals are always looking for more queer content. Yeah. Genre festivals are always looking for films that are, you know, on the fringes of genre so that they can appeal to different people. And then, of course, queer festivals are always looking for like horror or something they can classify yeah, as genre. Different. And like, so you're, you're clicked all the boxes to, to do that, I think, which is to make it appealing to all of those different festivals, which I'm sure is the only reason you made it that way is so you could get into the diaspora of film festivals that exist in this world. Yeah, um, our, exactly. <laughs> I'm curious. Um, this is just this is just I, because I just like I just like feeling the cringiness. What is the worst question you've ever gotten at a Q and A for the film? Oh gosh, I, I, I oof. There, I, can I tell you the worst comment I've gotten that what that, sure. that Q and A wasn't a question? The sure, first... we 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 put these out into the world so then we can just burn them to the ground because they don't matter. Uh, y- yes. The, the first thing somebody said to me after our first screening was, was um, they said, hey, I really like the film. You look a lot bigger on camera. Oh, no. And I was like, oh, th- uh, 
uh, and all I said, I didn't know what to say. So I was like, I was like, well, the camera adds 10 pounds. The guy said, or maybe 15. What? <laughs> was this a gay guy? It certainly was. Of course it was. Of course I was, it was. I was like, didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know what, what to do. What do you do with that? Like, Literally, my, not... par my parents were there, like, at that screening, on like, a couple feet away. And I thought, that's the... And, like, you know, I'm like, you see my butt in the movie? Like, I'm a little I'm a little briefly naked in it. All of a sudden, I'm like, my body. Like, I've never oh. had that. So, all yeah. of a sudden, I'm like, do how do I look? Who am I? And I thought, that's what you took away from it? Like, I think I look this... I It sent me on a spiral, like, that was so strange so strange so it wasn't a it, but it was somebody was like hey i wanted that i wanted like came to seek me out to tell me that you know oh. isn't that yeah, that's, crazy that's crazy that's a pretty good one i i always i hearken back to the worst and it wasn't even worse like it wasn't like that at all like i it, but it was i, I was in a q a for my film and uh, I had talked about one of my inspirations for my film, which was the George C. Scott film, The Changeling, which is yeah. one of my favorite horror films of all time. Oh, and good. this and this woman raises her hand and she was like, she was like, I just, well, for starters, these were her first comments. She was just like, I just don't, it just doesn't feel like you've seen many horror films. And she went on this rant to me who's seen every horror film known to man. She's and she so was wrong. like, and she was like, just the fact that you even like, this is even influenced by the changeling. She was like, she was like, it's not even a, it's not a good movie. It's not a scary film. And she starts rattling off all of these things. And about a minute into her discussion, into her talking, I'm realizing she's thinking that I'm talking about the Clint Eastwood, Angelina Joe Lee film changeling. Oh and and so literally I interrupt her. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I was like, no, I no, think no, you're no. thinking of a different film. I was like, the film you're talking about is a Clint Eastwood film. Angelina Jolie is in it. It is not a horror film. I was like, the film I'm talking about is a film, uh, sorry, George C. Scott. It's a horror film set. Yeah, I was like set in a mansion and I'm explaining this film to her. I was like, that's the film that I was inspired by. And then she just stopped. She's like, well, I haven't seen that one, but it must not have been very scary. And I'm like, oh, okay and so like she was like could just straight up like your film is not scary and i'm gonna let you know about it and um it was just like what do you do with that like what how do you, do you do like that how do like, you unpack you... that information for, for how did i still end this conversation feeling bad when you were talking about a clint eastwood movie for like two minutes um ne never underestimate people I, yeah, I, I, it's just, you know, it's always interesting to see what people will say, especially in Q&As. And I started realizing the more I do Q&As that people just ask the dumbest fucking questions sometimes that I'm like, why would you, you get your one chance to ask a question. This is it? This is the best you could come up with? Wow. Like, really? Like, yeah. that's just, that's mind boggling to me. Uh so what a horrible thing. What a horrible question you had to receive there. Oh my I God. Mean, what? I've also had people like, it's funny because uh, I've, I've written a bunch of like my immersive theater shows. Sometimes they're a little, a little artsy and like, what is the theme? What is the tone? And people will come up or well, not the tone. What is the theme of the whatever? And sometimes people come up to me after the shows and say, the show is about this, right? Like you were trying to say this in that moment. And I always say, yes, yeah. I always be <laughs> like, Yes, yeah, that's exactly what I meant. And we've had Q and A's where somebody somebody asked me wh how important was it me to like uh, essentially like end on a this is not really a spoiler for Joseph Cabin, but but sort of end on a note of hope. And I was like, huh? And and the 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 the, the person kept saying like, yeah, there's a lot of hope in your film. And honestly, Billy Ray. Hope was not one of the things I was going for necessarily. <laughs> I actually think it's kind of like a little dark. Like I think it's like a little sad and, and I'm on board for that. But I was like, let me yeah. just, I'm going to go with you on that and say like, let's talk about the ways hope could be represented yeah. by what you saw. And gosh, there was another one. Somebody, I realized somebody hadn't gotten the film. They're like, it's interesting that you included an element of time travel. And I was like, um, I didn't, I didn't. But then they kept talking and then actually got to a question. I was like, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna move on. Like, sure. Like, uh, it's, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the hope thing because I think there's, I, I hear this a lot about certain films or TV shows. Like, oh, it was so hopeful. The ending was so hopeful. And I'm like, 
I, I think I've had to just decide that there are two definitions of the word hopeful, right? There's there's the actual physical act of a film being hopeful and instilling yeah. hopefulness. And then there's just whatever the viewer, it, what their definition of hopeful is in that given situation. And it's yeah. usually the latter more than it is the former. Yes. But like sometimes I'm like, oh, it was such a hopeful ending. I'm like, was it? Yeah, and I never want to deny anyone's experience, especially when they enjoyed it, right? Yeah, so exactly. I just exactly. always was like, yes, that's right. That's what I meant. I love that we connected up. Like, yes, you know, like I just kind of roll with it sometimes with Q&As, with stuff where it's just like, oh, that's what you got out of that? Love that. That wasn't deeply my intention, but I genuinely love that, like, that's what you got out of it. You know, that's how yeah. you felt, you know, it was for you. So great. Well, to close out, I, I just finally want to ask, give me an idea. I, I want to ask everybody sort of what, who are a couple of filmmakers or a couple of films, you know, under the radar stuff, things that you're like, oh, these things slap hard uh, that you would like want to sit someone down and inject them into their eyeballs. Ooh, that's such a good question. Um, I feel like a lot of, Gosh, a lot of mine, a lot of the things that are coming to mind are, are things that it's all, it's all horror in my brain. Like it always comes hey, back to it horror. It can be all horror. This is a genre film festival after all. You know, like, and I know like everyone knows who Ari Aster is, but I like Bo is Afraid, like wild. Have you seen Bo is Afraid, Billy Ray? I have. I mean, whether you hate it or, <laughs> whether you hate it or love it, I feel like you may hate it, but whether you hate it or love it, like, uh, I have, ne what, what excites me about it is, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to have, I have wild, I have a wild range of things here. I'm excited by stuff that like, obviously that I guess, I thought, I thought it was really hopeful. I'm just kidding. I, I, I <laughs> I'm excited by stuff that has a different range of interpretation and is challenging to watch even still. Skinamarink. Did you watch Skinamarink? Oh yeah. I haven't. <laughs> I, I haven't. I'm, I'm, I'm misplanting those pauses intentionally. I haven't been able to make it through Skinamarink. And I love that. Like, I just, I'm just like, let's get weird. Like let's let's swing from the fences. Like let's make let's make a let's make a bold choice. And like it's your choice if you want to like if you want to watch it or not. You know, like I just I just love that those options exist. I never feel like I never get to. I feel like somebody's film doesn't get to a point where where things get so. I want things to keep keep taping a step forward in the extremes. And sometimes it's wrong and sometimes it's really, really, really bad. But like, I love, I love that both Bo is Afraid and Skin Rink choices were made, you know, I, yeah. and I'm still talking about both of them. And did I love either of them? Didn't finish Skin Rink and Bo is Afraid. I'm not sure how I feel about that for a long time, but I love that I'm still thinking about it and anything that like, that like lingers and is different and maybe some people can't stand it. I'm kind of on board for. <laughs> well said. Well said. Um, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us for episode. This is our inaugural episode. You're I'm our so first. Happy. You're, you're busting our YouTube cherry. Oh, my honor. My privilege again. Um, keep an eye out for Jessica Cabin when it drops on VOD later this year. That's right. We'll be, I'm sure we will post about that on the socials when that happens to send you in that direction. Um, we will be back next week uh, with our guest Oscar Harding, who is the filmmaker behind the documentary A Life on the Farm, which yes. won our juried award for Best Midlink. So we're going from our audience award to our juried award there. Oscar, incredible guy, incredible filmmaker. Uh, looking forward to chatting with him about that. And uh, again, thank you to Daniel for joining us on here. Thank uh, you for having I, me. Yeah, I hope it wasn't too painful. Not at all. I'm used to a little more pain, honestly. Um, boy, I could just make so many puns off of that and go down my much yeah. deeper rabbit hole. Oh, pun intended. I leave that for you. Instead, until next time, keep make believing, motherfuckers, and we will see you next week.